welcome everybody. Um, thank you for all being here today. Uh, and uh, I am going to cover today why invest in stocks. Um, thanks for taking time out of your day and and uh, coming here to learn something about hopefully helping you out in the financial in your financial future. So um, I've been a volunteer for about 30 plus years for a group called betterinvesting.org. And their mission is to help people become better, better investors and learn how to invest. Um, and so I will cover this topic today and I'll show you a little bit about better investing. It's a nonprofit organization and um, I think it does pretty good work helping people understand how to think about investing. Uh, I've been a long-term investor for about 40 years, um, actually now probably 50 years, uh, and uh, I'm also a financial professional working for a firm called Blossom Wealth over in uh, Alamo. So with that, let me get to the next slide here. This is our disclosure. So I'm going to talk on a bunch of different stuff today. Uh, I am not recommending any particular investments or purchase or sales of anything in particular or investments or any kinds of products other than I'm going to share with you about better investing. And if you so choose, you want to learn more, you're more than welcome to go find out more about us. Um, this is what I'm hoping to cover today. I'm going to spend a few seconds on better investing. I would touched on the fact that it's a nonprofit organization. Um, but we're going to cover what are stocks and bonds, investment returns and concepts, spend a second or two about investment options out there, and then and not inv not buying options per se, but what are your different choices to go use. Uh, talk on a couple easy strategies that many people could possibly do if they don't want to get more complicated and go and actually going and buying individual stocks. And then I'm going to spend some time at the end talking about DI, which is better investing and why we do what we do. Feel free to ask questions, uh, uh, put questions in the chat. We will take a break roughly halfway through to try to answer any questions people have. And uh, then at the end, we can also try to attempt to answer any people's questions. Um, as I said earlier, I, I've been a, fin a financial professional for about 40 some odd years at this point in time. Uh, my expertise was in asset allocation and equities, so the stocks. Uh, so I was an analyst for many years, and I still am an analyst. And, and so I spend my time looking for companies that I think look attractive. And so uh, I have a, a, some, some amount of experience in this space. Now, better investing itself is is uh, been around for uh, roughly 70 plus years. Uh, we've had thousands of different clubs over time. We've had thousands of different investors that have been involved with this organization. Uh, if you've heard of what an, an investment club, we were the pioneers of that. Um, we are the most important piece right now. I'm part of the 501c3 nonprofit organization. So there's various chapters around this country which has volunteers who spend their time helping people learn how to invest primarily from how we think about it from better investing, but just how to invest in general. So there's hundreds of different volunteer educators. And the last thing is we're just trying to create successful lifelong investors. We think anyone can do it. It just takes time, a little bit of pers uh, perseverance, and uh, everything's good. So with that, let's let's get into the, the meat of the top. Of this. What is a stock? Many people um, I think it confused what stocks are. They're not complicated. Uh, it's owning a piece of a, a business. And not all companies are public. A lot of companies are, but a lot of companies are not. But some, somewhere at the top is a form of security that indicates that the holder has a proportionate ownership of that company. You own a small slice of that business. Think about it that way. And, and it's not just not, you, you don't own a stock that just goes up, goes down. You own a piece of the business. So you want to find good quality business to own over long periods of time. So that's, that's the primary basic concept. And then the second bullet point touches on corporations issue stock to raise funds to operate their business. That's why they sell stock. So for them in the long run, the less stock they put out there, the better off they should be because they, you know, that means they're not giving away the business to a whole bunch of people over time. But reality is 
many companies issue lots and lots of stock and there there are roughly something over four to five thousand companies um, publicly traded i believe in the world here's another way of thinking about um proportionate ownership uh, of a company this is an ordinary common share so you own a piece of the company the very top you own a owner you own a piece of that company a slice of that company you also get a typically one vote per share at the annual general meetings now not all companies have that anymore some companies don't allow you to vote um, but there are most companies do additionally there's no liquidation pre preference so if the company goes bankrupt the bondholders get paid or could get paid will get paid first preferred stockholders will get paid and then common shareholders will get paid until that point in time um you know you are last on that list the reason why people like stocks is you have potential price appreciation over time and that's really the important piece So I mentioned preferred stocks a second ago. These are also a stock, but the difference with these is they pay a, a common income stream on a regular basis. And they also get tend to get paid first in bankruptcy. Um, if if they go bankrupt, if you need, if they when they sell the business off, they will tend to get paid, they will get paid first before common shareholders. Preferred stocks aren't huge in the stock market. There's not there's not billions of these things out there, but certain industries tend to use them a lot. Financial companies like banks, um, as well as utilities, they're not a bad way to generate income. Um, not a great way for price appreciation over time. They don't don't tend to have big price appreciation price appreciation like common stocks. So some basic stock concepts. Stocks are bought and sold predominantly on stock exchanges. The two that most people know about today, um, at least in the United States, is not New York Stock Exchange, NYSE, or the NASDAQ, N-A-S-D-A-Q. Um, both happen to be located in New York. Uh, they do have different requirements to be on which one, and, and that's the biggest differences between the two of them. Eventually, I suspect they might all merge into one eventually, but right now we have two. Many companies, many stocks do not pay dividends, um, but instead reinvest their profits back into the business. They don't share any of the profits with you as a shareholder in the form of a dividend. And then lastly, on this page, historically, stocks have outperformed other investments in the long run. There's a little chart to your right. It's very small to see. I'll have this on the chart on this slide a little bit later. But if you think about long time periods, in this case, about 90 to 100 years, stocks have done very well versus most other investments. And that also is, is true in shorter time periods than 90 years. Um, but you just be aware, stocks are, are a good way to grow your wealth over time. The rights of the shareholder, which I already touched a little bit on, which is you're entitled to a share in your portion of the company's profit over time. You get to attend the annual shareholder meetings. Um, you can vote. Typically, not everybody has voting rights, but many companies do. You can receive dividends if they are distributed. You also have the right to sell your shares at any time because it's a publicly traded company. If it's shares in a privately held company, you might not have that same liquidity availability to yourself. And be aware the company can always sell new shares out to the investors, which could dilute your ownership in the company. So. Those are things to think about as rights of a shareholder. Now, stocks and bonds are two different things. Stocks tend to have ownership in the company. You also have benefits of, from the growth of that company over time. And as profits are paid out in the form of dividends, you'd get a share of that. A bond is like a loan. You've loaned that money to the company and your benefits are you get paid interest on a regular basis from them and then eventually get paid back your, your original investment in that business if everything goes well. Um, so they act differently. Bonds tend to be much more or much less volatile than stocks. And thus, they make a very good thing to have in your portfolio next to stocks, depending on the risk level you have as an investor. So for, for what I would share with everybody is, you know, you think about 
how much risk you want to have as an investor. And then you then start building a portfolio with stocks and bonds to kind of match up with that risk level. Stocks tend to be very volatile, but have big potential price appreciation. Bonds, on the other hand, don't have lots of price appreciation for them typically, but they do generate income on a regular basis, and they don't tend to be much less volatile as an investment. Thus, you, we typically build portfolios that will combine both in a client's portfolio. Next, like I said, bonds are different than stocks. You're a creditor to the, to the company. You get paid back interest and principal. This is a contract with them, with you. They owe you that to do. They owe that to you. You will stand in line first, um, typically uh, uh, after just a few other groups of people, um, if there's a bankruptcy. Um, bonds will typically have a duration or a maturity. When do they mature or when do they expire out there? Uh, they could range from a month to six months to a year to 20 years. And then finally, um, the return you get from a bond is typically in the form of interest rates or interest, I should say. And they are typically paid on a periodic basis. Most bonds pay them anywhere from two times a year to four times a year. There are some uh, things that will pay 12 times a year on a monthly basis, but most bonds will typically pay twice a year. So I said I'd share this chart with you earlier in, in bigger form, and this is a chart. It's a few years old, but the statistics haven't changed. Um and it's going back to 1926, so almost 100 years here. And what you can see is stocks deliver the best return on investment over the long term. And that is the yellow and blue line at the very top. And this is this is making a dollar investment back in 1926 and watching it grow ever since then. And small cap stocks typically tend to have higher volatility, but they also tend to generate a slightly higher return over time. And that allows you to make significantly more money. And you can see a 12.4% return on an annual basis versus a 10.4%. That two percentage points is a big difference from a dollar perspective over long time periods. And, and so you think of these two at the very top of your stocks, then the bottom you have bonds, T-bills, and inflation. Um, good things to have in your portfolio. They have their own purpose as an investor, not inflation, by the way, um, but T-bills and government bonds are good things to have in your portfolio, depending on your risk level, depending on how far away you are from needing that money, i.e. or close to retirement or close to funding a child's education. So all these things go into a piece of day. But in the long run, this is one of the first charts I came to when I came out of college um, and, and saw the benefit of why stocks are interesting to investors and why they should be in most people's portfolios. And yes, as you can see in the middle of this chart, this is the 70s, end of 60s, early 70s, they can go down. And they can go down a lot. You can see here in 2008, it really came down a lot. But in the long run, the stock line keeps on moving up. So, but you can get lots of volatility. So I, I don't want to minimize volatility because it's real, it's out there. But in the long run, you tend to get paid for it. Probably the second most important chart I'm going to show you today um, is this one from, from a perspective of stocks, bonds, and what's called a 50-50 portfolio, which means you have 50% in stocks and 50% in bonds. And those have colors of blue, which is stocks, gray, which is bonds, and the purple 50-50 portfolio. And, and I've put a red box around the one year and a green box around the five, 10, and 20 year rolling time horizon. And so what you can quickly see is on the left in the red box, the one year time frame you have a lot of volatility in any one year. Stocks could be positive 47% to minus 39%. The gray bonds could be plus 43 to minus eight. Actually, that's now minus, I think, 14% because 2022 bonds were down around 14% for that year. And then a combined portfolio, again, has a lot of upside and also a lot of downside. 
But when you start investing and you're doing it for a rolling time period, meaning I started investing in 2000 and then I looked at what happened from 2000, 2005, and I put those numbers up. And then I did the same thing from 2001 to 2006, then the same thing for 2002 to 2007. And you start adding up what those five-year returns are. You can see that the volatility starts dropping off dramatically and everything gets skewed to more of a positive return over time, which says investments generally are a positive return if you're willing to do it and stay in it for a period of time, five years, 10 years, 20 years. Uh, and what you can see very clearly that after a 10 year time period, stocks are almost always positive. There's, there's, there was a period that you lost over a 10 year period, you lost 1% of your money. So that means your money that you started off with that $10,000 you started off 10 years ago is now worth $9,900 or something like that. Um, it hasn't really gone anywhere. But on the other hand, you could have been the per invested at the time where went, went, it went up 19% for that every year for that 10 year time horizon. So the point is the returns tend to skew to a positive return over literally 5, 10, 20 years. And you see for a 20 year time horizon, there's nothing that's negative. So what that tells me, and this is going back over 70 years, what it tells me as an investor, if I have a 20 year time horizon, and many investors do, um, I should probably be having my money into stocks and or depending on my time horizon, uh, maybe a combination 50 50 or something like that, because I am going to get a better return over time. We can talk more about that if there's questions on it. Um, next piece, I want to cover how to build wealth or think about building wealth through some investing theories and concepts. And the first one is compound interest. Um, and that is, as Albert Einstein wrote here, it's the eighth wonder of the world. Uh, he also says he who earns it, understands it, will earn it. And those who don't understand it will pay it, meaning that you're going to end up maybe with more debt if you don't fully understand how compound interest works. But the real benefit behind compound interest is time. So as an investor, time works in your favor. The longer you are involved in investment, typically the better off it should be over time. And it's very, very powerful. And so I actually have several slides on this topic because um, I think it's so important for you to think about. So this is just a simple versus compound interest uh, page. And we're using a 10% compound interest for 20 years. And so we put our $1,000 in, at the end we get back our $1,000 and we get back $2,000 of interest. There's no compounding that goes on. However, this purple area is the compound interest. This is where you got interest throughout this period and then you earned interest on top of the interest you earned. So it starts building up very quickly. And as you can see, it can magnify very quickly. In this case, it would have grown to over $7,000 by just simply compounding that interest at a 10% rate over that time period. So this is the part that people don't always understand, um, but it's very, very, very important. If your stock is growing at a, let's say a 20% growth rate, well, that's compounding very quickly. And in theory, should be worth a lot down the road. If the growth of that business slows down, well, then people are gonna value that company differently at that lower growth rate. If, it, if they think it's going to grow faster, well, then they'll increase what they think the company's worth over time. So compound interest is a very, very important concept to think about. And so the last slide I have on this is, is this little cute little chart, um, because when I start talking about time value, time and investing, I will usually get a comment later on in the presentation, well, I've missed it. I'm too old. I've missed the opportunity to get invested. And the answer is it's never too late to start, number one. Never too late to start saving. And even if you're retiring, I'm going to go into Medicare this year. So I'm 65. I still probably have, based on the probability charts 
based on a, a male of my age, that I have 20 plus years ahead of me still cross our fingers. And um, so that's a long time. And I just showed you 20 years should give me a chance of getting really good positive returns over that time horizon. And that's very important. So it's not too late to start at any point in time. The longer the time frame, the greater the effect. So let's be clear, your kids, your grandkids, yes, if you can put some money away for them when they're young, it will grow for them for a very long time. They will get the biggest benefit. Of if you're already 65, well, you don't have, you can still do yourself a good deal, but you won't get the same benefit as someone that has 40 or 50 or 60 years for it to grow. And then we go through some other details about this, where, where it has, how you earn some interest, then you earn more of it as you reinvest it back in the business. And that's how you get the compounding effect over time. Um, understand very clearly that interest rates and all the examples you always see show a, a constant interest rate. That's, you know, let's be clear. That's not real. We know interest rates move around on a regular basis. And if you're taking all the earnings out or dividends out on a regular basis to live off of, well, your earnings are not co not compounding upon itself. And uh, so that's something else to be thinking about as you do that. So next slide. Again, this is going to show your benefits of starting early and cons being consistent, which is key for an investor. So we're going to start over here with a green arrow. So I put green arrows on here and green arrows where you would be on the on the on the returns over time. And, and this one just makes the assumption that Susan starts with five thousand dollars a year that she invested from the ages each year from twenty five to thirty five. She invests a total of fifty thousand dollars over those ten years. So that's going up to here. And then she stops. She doesn't invest another dollar and then just starts earning interest and in, in returns on that over time. And assuming the same rates of return, it grows to $602,000. We go to Bill and Bill, like a lot of people will say, you know, I don't have time now. I got to go get a new car. I want to go have a trip. I want to go have some fun. He says, I, I don't have time when I'm in my 20s. I'm going to start when I'm 35. And then he starts at 35 and he puts the same $5,000 away. And then he does it consistently to age 65. He invests $150,000 versus Susan's 50. And what you can see is based on the same rates of return, after all this time period, hasn't quite caught up with where Susan is. That's the time value of money. That's the important piece you have to remember. Now, eventually, Bill will catch up. Because he's continuing to put, if he, if he continues to put money in going forward. But, you know, that is the benefit of starting early and helping out um, if people are young and wanting to invest. Uh, that it's, it's quite important. And then lastly, we have Chris. And Chris spends 5000 puts invests $5,000 every year throughout the whole time period, puts in $200,000. And you can see his amount is roughly twice as high as Susan um, and more than twice as high. Uh, of bill. And, and so these, these are statistics we know. We know starting early will help people um, get to a better pile of money down the road. Um, however, we also know that a lot of people, when you're young, you have so many things pulling at you. You, you know, you're wanting to get maybe a new vehicle to drive. You need to get a new apartment. Apartments are expensive. Cars are expensive. You decide to have children. All these get in the way of building this up. But these are the realities. We know what the numbers can do for people. People just have to understand that they ha they also have to take responsibility and say, how do I help myself over long periods of time? Now, another big comment I hear, and, and I literally got this two days ago when I met with a client over in Sacramento. Uh, and he said, well, what about getting out of the market when things look bad? And the problem is, it's easy to look back and say, oh, markets are bad. We shouldn't have been invested here. Looking forward is a much more difficult thing. And, and like I said, I've been doing this for 40 years. And, and I don't really, I, I know where we'll be in 10 years. At least I think what kind of growth we should expect. Five years, I have some idea. 
I can't tell you what's going to happen at the end of this year. I have opinions. I have thoughts. I spend my time reading all kinds of stuff, but nobody really can tell you where the markets will be at the end of this year, end of this month, end of tomorrow, um, assuming we're open tomorrow. But everyone will expound on how they do. So my goal is always to put the statistics to my favor. And so one of the statistics, as we just saw about time value of money, is also staying in the market over most periods of time. And we're going to look at these 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 couple of choices here. If you stayed fully invested during the time that they measured this, which is a relatively short time period, 20 years, that if you're fully invested the whole time, you earned a 7.68 return. If you missed 20 of the best days, your return dropped down to 1.57. If you happen to miss 60 of the best days, you, you had a negative return of minus 5.76. So missing the good days, and they're not easy to anticipate they're coming, is difficult. And I think this commentary right in the, on the right-hand side of the big green arrow at it is important. Six of the best 10 days occurred within two weeks of the 10 worst days. They happen close to each other. So if a bad day happens, maybe you should think about starting to invest. But most people, emotions will get in the way and say, oh, no, this looks scary. This looks ugly. I don't want to get involved yet. And that is what ends up happening for a lot of people. I, I hear it all the time. I want to invest. When the, when the economy gets better, then I'll feel more comfortable investing. But when the economy is better, the stock market's gone up. So you want to actually be buying when things are on sale, not when things have already been marked up. Invest according to a plan. There's been numbers of studies done um, by a number of different groups, whether it's uh, the Certified uh, Financial Planners Group or other uh, organizations, that if you have a plan, it doesn't have, I mean, it's nice if you write it down and, and, and make it organized. It doesn't have to be hugely detailed. But if you start lining up, what are your long-term goals? retirement, kids, college funds. How are you going to achieve those? Use short-term goals, down payment on a home, vacation, new boat, car, you know, all these things. If you start making plans, you tend to have a much better chance of getting to those plans than if you don't. Um, at the very bottom, you know, how much money do you need now? How much money will you need in the future? How much time before you need it? Again, remember, go back to our slide, the time value of money. If I have a long time to go, that helps you plan for your retirement, kids' college fund, et cetera, et cetera. Statistically, we do know people that do tend to plan tend to have better outcomes in the long run. Then inflation is, and, and, and inflation has come down versus what it was, but I think all of us can probably sit back and, and, and say, we've seen a bunch of inflation over the last couple of years. Uh, inflation has been fairly rampant. Uh, and it just perch it, it just reduces your purchasing power over time. It just wears it down. And so a dollar becomes much less as time. As you know, I mean, if you went to let's say a McDonald's five years ago, you could have probably gotten a meal there for five, six, seven dollars. Well, it seems like today it's probably closer to 10 or maybe even more. And that's inflation going on. So you need to have things that will help fight inflation. Things that we have found historically work well, stocks typically do fairly well versus inflation over long periods of time. Particularly companies that grow their dividends over time tend to do better against inflation. Um, gold has at different times done fairly well versus inflation. So precious metals have also done relatively well. And so these are things that we'd want to think about maybe having in your portfolio um, as a way to help hedge and fight against this bugaboo. For most investors in retirement, inflation is your is your biggest thing you're fighting. That and running out of money. Um, running out of money is probably first. Second is inflation. Um, because, you know, a lot of people have, tend to be on fixed income. Um, that's why you hear about fixed income in retirement, folks. And thus inflation just eats away for them over, over a 10, 20, 30 year time horizon. So let me stop here. Uh, see if we have any questions because uh, I've covered yeah. a bunch of different topics. Yeah, Craig. So um, there's a few in the chat. Um, I'll just read them out. Um, some people are uh, asking for some advice, investment advice. Um, Julie 
asks, can you please discuss SBUX worth the buy, uh, worth the buy now for a long term hold? Thanks. I can't really comment specifically on individual companies. Um, I will just tell you, Starbucks is the leading company in the coffee space, uh, and it's had a very good good business model for long time horizons. I think the biggest thing they're struggling right now is with China. That is their biggest market after the United States. And so once China starts recovering in their economy, I suspect Starbucks will do better. David asks, what index funds do you like for long-term investing? And followed it followed up that question with, I'm heavily weighted in Comcast stock, and I know I need to diversify, but I've been hesitant to exit the position because I will have to pay a lot of tax and then invest it into something else sure. how do you make the decision to sell stocks to and exit the position how do you feel about comcast stock long-term hold <laughs> um i again i won't specifically talk on companies uh, on a specific basis but uh, i will talk on some indexes later i like broad-based indexes I like indexes that follow basic markets. So things that follow the S&P 500 United States, things that follow big markets around the world. Um, so I'm a very much player of low cost, large, broad-based indexes. So it could be the bond market, it could be the stock market. And I'll show you some examples later. As to an individual holding, if you have a large weight in any particular company, just understand you have risk. You could have a very loud, large and annoying announcement tomorrow from your company that you happen to have a large amount of stock in and your stock could fall x percent the next day 10 20 30 40 percent it is as an individual shareholder in a company that's your biggest risk is as an individual stock is that company does underperform so Typically, when we get involved with clients that have large holdings of one particular stock, we look to diversify themselves over time, selling a piece of it on a, on a regular basis to break that tax burden out over years and diversify themselves into other things that are will hopefully get them a good return on the other side. So that's what I, I, I would comment on that. And just lastly, on Comcast itself, just simply, they are, I think, the largest guy in the cable business. But understand you have a lot of threats coming from all kinds of directions, whether it's YouTube, streamers out there, and, and the streaming world seems to be getting pretty aggressive over time. So just be aware. That's, that, that is probably the biggest issue that industry has to, uh, not just Comcast, but the whole industry has to figure out how do they fit in that world in the long run. That's it. And this is a related question by Julie. S&P 500 index funds versus total market index funds. Which one do you prefer? Um, I'm old school. I've always gone with S&P. It doesn't matter. They're, they'll, they'll basically op, they'll perform fairly close with each other. The biggest difference between total market is it will encompass more small and mid-sized companies in it. And when those parts of the markets do well, that index will do better than the S&P 500, but they will be within a stone's throw of each other over long periods of time. Based on my earlier chart, over long time horizons, smaller companies should get a better return. Thus, total the total index should get a better return over time. That has not happened for the last five years, by the way. Um, but it should get you a better return over time. And Julie asks, currently the stock market is so high. What are your recommendations to start somewhere? Uh, interest is high. Conservative is good. Um, I think that's probably a better question for the end, uh, if we have time to go cover that specifically, uh, if you can hold on to that remark. Okay. I will. Uh, And Aaron asks, is for is Roth 401k compounding interest? Uh, the investments in there, yes, because it's you're not pulling that money out. It, it's it, it has, it's compounding growth. Not, not it might not be interest because you might just have stocks in there. But if you have investments in there and they're paying out some income, and you're reinvesting that over time, that's that would be the same thing as compounding. So yes, most retirement plans typically 
have that compounding effect involved because you're not pulling that money out until you retire. Okay. Virginia asks, what would you recommend reading to learn more about investing and and the current investing landscape. I just want to add that we do have a book list um, that the library has put together on investing. I'll share that. Um, but Craig, would you have anything to recommend? Um, I, I, Peter Lynch has written a number of books over the years. Uh, I think he has like three or four of them out that are, are really good. Um, so I would highlight them. I, I will tell you about better investing later on and why you should come to us and, and, and hear what we have to say about the world, because we do have lots of things, including over 100 videos of how to think about investing and, and all the stuff that goes along with it. So there's there's thousands of books out there. I've read lo lots and lots and lots of books. Um, I have another book I will tell you about. A friend of mine wrote, um, but I'll have to go grab it from you. But I think it's called Empower Your Investing. And it's done by Scott Chapman. And he wrote this about five years ago over the last 20 years. And he followed three well-known investors, uh, Warren Buffett, Peter Lynch, and, 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 and one other, that um, they, he shared their history of how they invested over time. And, and I thought that book was quite, quite good. He was also a person I worked with for a number of years, so I have lot of value with him so um those would be some books to think about but pretty much the more you read the more you understand um and and you know you just got it's a it's a continual process okay so okay. i put i put the link to empower your investing we do have it here at sfpl so okay. you can click on it and you can check it out it's i believe it's available both as a physical book and an ebook um Okay, should we go on and then we can I think we could go on and um I have it marked here of who's who would be next when okay. we resume questioning. Okay. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Okay. Um I do want to try to stay on 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 track time wise for everyone. I want to be respectful for everyone's day. So there are a lot of things, a lot of ways to invest. There are three basic ways when you want to look at the stock market or the bond market. Um, you can buy an individual stock. It trades throughout the day. You can buy, and that's on the left. And on the right, you can buy a mutual fund, which is diversified versus an individual stock. Diversified meaning it has a number of holdings in, in its portfolio. But it trades at the very end of the day, once a day. Uh, and, 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 and so you don't know how it's doing throughout the day. And in the middle is something called an ETF, exchange traded fund. It's a diversified fund, like a mutual fund, but it trades throughout the day. And we have found that this has become a very um, interested spot for most people to start looking at and investing in. It also has another benefit that has come as a little bit of a surprise um, over the years. I don't think people were quite expecting this. It also tends to be a, a better from a tax perspective to use an ETF versus a mutual fund. And that's because of how they trade and they operate. Having been a mutual fund op uh, fund manager at one point in my life, um, I can easily see why this works much better from a tax perspective for investors. So also think about this page on the left-hand side, owning in individual stocks. We talked earlier about Starbucks, and we talked about Comcast. Owning an individual name has a lot of risk because it's only one company. Owning a portfolio of companies, a diversified portfolio, tends to have lower risk versus a single any single stock. On the other hand, you could be the guy that bought Tesla 25 years ago or 20 years ago, whenever it came public, and could have made a fortune over the last 20 years. So that's the give and take of stocks, ETFs, and mutual funds. Going more on this subject, um, these are the three areas I think most people would think about investing. Mutual funds and ETFs are good for the experienced investor. Um, I talked earlier about S&P 500s. I think total interest, total market return um, index funds like from Vanguard and others are just fine. Uh, I think they they all do the same thing. You're getting exposure to the broad-based market. If you're buying an ETF or a mutual fund that's exposed to technology stocks or semiconductor stocks only, well, that's a higher risk level 
then I would prefer, I would like to be broadly based, at least at first, what I'm doing in investing. Uh, and, and I think that is how most people will build wealth over time. And then once you be comfortable with the concept of comfortable with the concept of investing and watching stocks go up and oh by the way they go down uh you might then want to diversify in individual stocks and individual individual stocks can offer the potential for great returns like i mentioned uh you know nvidia has been a fantastic stock for a long period of time tesla was a great stock up to a couple of years ago um it's it's pulled back a little bit but to do individual stocks you have to think about three t's it's time it's talent and it's temperament. And that is the important piece. And we are going to touch on this a little bit later. Do you have the time to do the research? Do you have the temperament to live with it when it goes down and do not sell out at the bottom? Um, or likewise, sell it all out after it's gone up a bunch and then you're out and then watch it go up a bunch more. Uh, and the talent meaning, can you do the research? Do you want to do it? Do you have? Are you willing to spend the time? And it, it, investing in stocks is nothing that complicated, but it does take time and it takes effort. It just doesn't come easy. So a quick refer, review on mutual funds. It just really simply, as you put your money into the fund, the fund manager gets that money to go invest. He invests based on bullet point number two, based on the fund's guidelines. So once he knows, once you say, I want to buy this fund, let's say it's a stock fund. Well, what kind of a stock fund? Is it a large cap fund? Is it a small cap fund? Is it a dividend only fund? All those things will be defined in what's called a prospectus. So you at least should be aware there is something called a prospectus. But the money goes in, into the fund house. They, they buy some securities based on what their prospectus says. And then it'll generate some returns. And some of that will get passed back to the investor, either in price appreciation of the fund or in dividends and interest that you might have earned from that particular investment. It's a pretty straightforward process. An ETF is very looks very similar to this, except not all the funds don't always go back to the mutual fund company. You might trade with somebody else in the open market, and that's what gives it the tax advantage um, that you should have out there. And that that's really the biggest difference is um, as a mutual fund manager at the beginning of the day, you get told how much money you got from the prior day or how much money left. With an ETF, you trade with somebody else who's looking to buy or sell. And then when if there's enough buying out there, they'll go and actually buy more shares of the ETF or sell shares of the ETF. You, as an individual, won't do that. These are market makers behind the scene that do all that for you. Um, but here's some quick bullet points to think about. What's the difference between the two? Exchange-traded funds are traded throughout the day. They might be more tax efficient. Um, there can be some commissions charged on, on trading these. Not as many as they used to be. Most firms are not charging much of any commissions these days. Uh, and they will follow an index, most likely, more likely than not, um, and try to keep in line with that index. They're not trying to, quote, unquote, beat the market. They're just trying to act like the market. Mutual funds are purchased and sold at the end of the day. They're great for periodic savings plans. If I want to put it in 100 bucks a month, it works just fine. Same thing can be done with exchange-traded funds. Um, there are a variety of ways of how you pay for those funds. Some have no fees of, uh, as a sales charge. Others have different types of fee structures. But both of these... Both of these all will charge some sort of a management fee for managing the, the mutual fund or the ETF. What we also know on about ETFs is they typically, historically, have been lower cost than mutual funds. So that's been a big reason why a lot of assets have moved from the mutual fund world to the exchange tra traded fund world, because the fees are typically, typically lower because they're typically trying to just follow an index. They can be quite similar. This, otherwise, they're very similar to each other, and they all own baskets of stocks, bonds, or other assets like, let's say, gold, which has been popular lately. There's also something relatively new in the last 10 years called actively managed. Oh, well, I should, let me change that. There's always been actively managed funds, but there's also something called actively managed ETFs, 
those are relatively new in the last 10 years. Um, so that's still a growing area. The managers of an actively managed fund are buying stocks because they believe they will outperform the market or the index. That is their goal. Many fund traders typically end up trading quite a bit, which can, can sometimes go against them. And then lastly, most are not terribly tax efficient, um, unlike an ETF. You also tend to pay more for this active management. Why? Because you're paying for their skill set. You want them to do better over time. And sometimes they do very, very well, and sometimes they struggle. Historically, what we have found is that um, most active managers tend to underperform their benchmark um, pretty consistently over time. So what that tells us is index funds typically are a good way for people to get invested early on and for over long periods of time. Having said that, active management can do very well and has historically done better in bad markets than good markets, but it's not always the case. So index funds also are sometimes called passively managed funds, if you think about it that way. You're just tracking this index. You're just trying to get exposure to whatever that index is investing to. If it's a small cap index, well, you're investing in small companies. If it's an international index, you're investing in international companies. The expense ratios tend to be very low. I've seen it as low as one basis point versus, let's say, 1%. The lower the fees, the better you are as an investor over long time periods of time, we think. So it gives you the benefit uh, of tax efficiency because the turnover could be a lot lower um, because of how ETFs are managed and how index are managed. Um, next slide. So here is just a bunch of different data on large cap funds, small mid cap funds, small cap funds. And again, over 10 or 15 years, most of them do not keep up with their respective benchmark. Doesn't mean you shouldn't own them. It just means that you need to be aware of what they can do and can't do. Sometimes they might be beneficial if they are a slow grower during the good years, but do better during the bad years. Um, you'd have to go back and measure that. This is one of the reasons this performance page is one of the reasons why so many investors have been moving from what's called active management to passive management in the last uh, 20 years. And this, this trend has not slowed down. I suspect it will continue going for a long time. Part of it's the performance side. And part of it is the next slide here, which is the impact of fees on investing. If you have lower fees, guess what? You, the investor, keep more in your pocket. Not very complicated. And that's all this chart is really trying to show you is over a long time period. Um, if you're at the top chart, you have a 1.5% fee. If you're at the bottom, you have a 5% fee. Clearly, you have less money if you have a 5% fee. And that's the real thing to think about why index funds, I think, have been the primary, second, tied with the return issue. Um, biggest reason why people have been shifting money to passive and index funds over the last 20 years. So investing outside of your employees and retirement plan, building up your assets for life so you can have assets to live on that aren't just retirement assets. Because if they're just retirement assets, if that's all you have, guess what? Every dollar you take out of that retirement account, unless it's a Roth, will be taxable income to you. So it'll be just like if you're still working, your taxes will not go down in retirement. Uh, well, it would depend on how much you pull out, really. But so that's something to think about is building up assets outside of retirement plans, because that will help you manage your tax liability during your retirement years. So I said earlier, I, I mentioned a couple ETFs or, or, or things to think about investing. The simple thing to do is a total stock market index fund. Someone mentioned that earlier versus an S&P. I personally see the two as pretty darn similar with each other. So I don't have a strong opinion between one or the other. But this is the easy plan. Just pick one, invest in it. it as long as it's well diversified domestically, uh, has low cost, you reinvest those earnings, you don't have to do anything. Just let it compound with the markets. Some years they'll do great because the markets do great. You know, sometimes markets will do poorly. So 
Those are things you just need to be aware of. So that's the simplest plan. Almost a simple plan, you diversify. Add some small cap, because I showed earlier that performed a little bit better than large cap stocks over time. You could also add international funds in there. So that's a plan B. You're more globally diversified. It should be very low cost. Um, and th so these are all very th easy things to do. And you, you know, by doing just these three funds, you are pretty diversified as an investor because you are, have assets around the world and you get the get benefits of around the world growth. So last topic is learn how to invest in stocks. Um, and this is where we get into more about better investing. So our investment philosophy at better investing is we want to think stocks should be viewed for the long-term basis. We also think you should focus on the company performance, both proven and potential. So we'd like to look at history and tell you and help, help have used that to help us predict the future. Um, earnings are the ultimate driver of the stock price. We think those are connected over long time periods, 10, 20 years, um, not in any one month, day or quarter, but over time periods, we think they are correlated very highly. Um, lastly, you wanna buy a stock at a reasonable price. Uh, we don't focus on emotional market swings. In fact, we probably do the exact opposite. When when the market's down, usually people in better investing world is all talking about all the things they want to go buy. We tend to be buyers when things are being sold off and tend to be sellers when things are getting fairly expensive out there. Bottom line is we firmly believe as in better investing world, anyone can be a successful long-term investor. I've seen it for my four, 30 years of been doing this. Anyone can do it. It just takes time. It takes talent and it takes temperament. And, you, you know, but you do can control it. You can control what you buy. You control what you sell. You can control how much you're going to pay for those stocks. You can also control the fees. Um, and finally, uh, Better Investing offers uh, tools, techniques, and trainings to help you do that. As I said earlier, we have over 100 different videos that are available as a member to view and learn how to become a Better Investing as well as they do have almost, I think almost every night, there's some webinar going on someplace in the country that are usually free uh, for you to hear someone talk about different things to invest. Learn as an investor, investment basics, so you understand. Learn how to evaluate a stock to go buy, as well as probably sell. Learn to keep your emotions at bay and, and sleep at night. Learn how individual stocks may have great potential for you. Learn that investing can be fun. And I think it is. And again, learn to invest in yourself. That will help you control your financial future. So I'm going to offer, give you a freebie here. Um, go to betterinvesting.org. Look for the Sciences Open House. Click on it. This little, will pick up, well, this little portion will pop up. It's going to ask for your name, going to ask you for your email address, and they're going to give you some samples of what we do in our world. There's no charge. There's no credit card. It's just, we're going to share that out with you. In addition, so this is at no cost to you. Just go click on there, give them the email address and, and see what we have to offer. You might or might not like it. It's not for everybody. Trust me. There's only certain things. We think our approach has common sense. These are our three tools that we use. We have more than that, but these are the three basic ones. We have a, a very good magazine that comes out monthly. I have written in it at different times, and it's a, a nice investment magazine to write. A, this is our tool to how we analyze stocks. And this is the website. And in here are the things about everything from how to find a great stock, learn about investing. As and I'll go, That's where you find those 100-plus uh, videos out there. You get community support. As I mentioned earlier, we have all these chapters around the country. There's 11 volunteers like myself in San Francisco chapter that are here to help you try to become a better investor. Not necessarily in one-on-one -on -one cases, but as group presentations or as clubs or however you want to do it, we usually can help out in some way or fashion. We're firm believers that clubs uh, are, are supportive and a good thing to go do. Um, they provide a safe and supportive way to learn to invest for most people. Again, together, I think we can do more. Here's our core four reasons we think about investing. A couple of slides of different clubs across the country. Um, and then lastly, you can visit clubs. And San Francisco has a model club. I'll show you how to get to the visit club on the next slide. But if you want to go to the model club, just go to this link here, um, San Francisco Bay Chapter, which I think was shared earlier by Ramon. We meet monthly typically the second Thursday of every month at 545. 
So um, I believe this coming Thursday will be our meeting. And it goes on for about an hour and a half. And it's a it's a regular meeting. We all have our money invested in there. So you can listen in, see how we do things. If you have an interest, uh, feel free of uh, reaching out either in the meeting or outside. You can reach to me. I've been a, one of the founders of the club, and, and I think it's been a great way to go. We're, I think, we're over about 150,000 invested and about 16 or 17 members at this point in time. And uh, we just added two new people in the last uh, month and a half. There's also a contact email there for you to reach out to if you so choose. If you want to join a club, that's going to be on the right. You can also go call, go on the website and go to visit a club. And there's four clubs that are on that list currently that are, I believe it's four, that are open to you to go reach out to and say, can I come visit your club? I've been to each and every one of those clubs. I think they all do fantastic jobs. Um, so, you you know, if you want to get to an exciting club, all of them are available. One of those is the San Francisco Model Club. If you say, say I just want to join a club, well, understand we also have this new thing called Investment Club Connect. You put your information in, clubs in our area put in join from the other side saying, we might have an interest in getting someone to join our club, and then Better Investing does it in the background. So there's two now ways to kind of do all that. And then, so in summary, as an investor, take time to learn how to invest. It's not complicated. It's not hard. It does take time, though. Um, your future will depend on it. Trust me. Um, time is your friend when you're investing. So even if you might be 60 today, you still got a long time horizon in front of you. But your kids and grandkids have a long time ahead of them. Help them grow their financial future for them. Learn how to use stocks, bonds, and ETFs. Planning is, I think, a very important thing to do so that you can be prepared for the future. And again, lastly, visiting betterinvesting.org, I think, can help. So with that, I have questions and answers, but I also have in the last two pages a sample of our stock of a stock analysis that uh, we did for Apple. And you can go look at that and so you can see this is what we produce. This is what we have all our club members in our model club. They all know how to do this, build these reports up and do it. It doesn't take much time. Our software is quite good and uh, it doesn't take much time, but this is what we want to find. Companies that go and grow up until the right. And that's what we're trying to do. So let me stop there. I know I'm a, we're almost a few minutes late. So Ramon, questions? Yeah, so um, we have quite a few questions. So apologies in advance if we don't get to all of them. Uh, I will skip over some similar questions. Um, but again, we have our contact information in the chat as well as uh, Craig also provided his, his um, contact information. So please reach out to us uh, if we don't get a chance to answer those questions. So the first question is by Winnie. Can you still lose money in a fixed rate bond that's doing bad even if you wait uh, till, term, till the term ends? So if a bond... Well, so, so two questions there. If you bought the bond at a price below what's called its par value or what it gets, what it matures at, then at maturity, you should get paid your par value. So the answer would be no. If it's currently trading below the par value, it has the ability to go back to par at maturity, assuming the company does, the company or the bond doesn't go bankrupt before that point. Since many, if it's a high quality bond, I really wouldn't worry about it too much. But if you have a question, you know, reach out to a financial professional and ask. Bonds can lose money. 2022 was the worst year for bond markets since the uh, mid 70s. And bonds in general were down anywhere from 10 to 15%. Um, if you had just a bond that had an average maturity of six years, so they can go down. Um, not likely they're going to go down as much at this point because rates have gone up. So bonds act differently than the uh, to interest rates. So as interest rates go up, bonds go down in value. And likewise, as interest rates go down, bonds will appreciate. Bonds, preferred stocks all act the same way relative to interest rates. So if we're in the world where interest rates might be going down in the future, bonds could appreciate going forward. 
Okay. Uh, I'm uh, uh, looking to start investing and purchase stock for the first time. Any advice on how to allocate and start a portfolio with a starting budget of $1,000? I think I'd go to the simplest plan that I showed on that slide. Uh, start off with an, a, you know, a broad-based index fund. Uh, you can get it from, from anybody. I have almost virtually no cost these days, whether it's uh, Fidelity, Schwab, Vanguard, um, and, and you know, open an account. You know, you can decide if you want to invest it all at once, or stage it in and put five two hundred fifty dollars in today. Wait a month, put another two hundred fifty dollars in, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I tend to be a chicken, so I tend to stage my money in over time. But uh, historically, the statistics will tell you if you put it in and you hold your 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 nose for the next five, 10, 20 years, you, you won't be worrying about it. And typically, when you go back and look at it, you got to go, oh, yeah, it doesn't really matter if I bought on a high. Let's say the market's at an all time high today. 20 years from now, the market's at a higher price than it was 20 years ago. Um, historically, that's always been the case. And so um, usually work out works out just fine. Okay, Elliot asks, would you recommend buying low and selling high with broad index funds, not individual stocks? What are some rules of thumb for avoiding excessive taxes whenever you buy and sell like like this or rebalance? So buying low, I, I, I love that concept. Um, selling high, yes, it's, it's good to trim some of it, but that's probably your best way to controlling your taxes is not selling it all out. Because again, if you sell it all out, you're making the determination that the market will not go up from here, which I'm telling you, I've been doing this for 40 years. I can't make that bet. Um, I might have a belief over the next month, two months, three months, one year, maybe things won't be as good, but I don't have that skill set. And, and I have several degrees after my name. Uh, I've been doing this for 40 plus years. I don't think anyone can has a really good skill set of figuring out where the market's going tomorrow or the next day. So I, I'm very loath to want to sell it all out of a position. Would I trim and take some profits off? Sure, that's okay. That will also control your tax bill. But making the bet to get out and get back and then assuming you can get out and then get back in again is very difficult. And I know very few people in my life that are very good at it. Jen asks, can you repeat which industries have done well over time? Gold, uh, previous metals? Oh, um, that was to fight inflation. So to fight inflation, we, we've, we've, we have found dividend growing companies out there typically have done a pretty good job. Why? Because they grow their dividends consistently over time. And, and there's, there's, there's lots of different indexes that do that. Probably the most famous is um, the dividend aristocrat. Um, ETF, or I think it's NOBL. Again, I'm not recommending this. It just it, it has it has a long term track record of dividend growth. Vanguard Dividend Appreciation is another one that has a good long term track record of dividend. Growth. But to fight inflation is having consistent growing income streams um, is one way to fight inflation. Um, real estate investment trusts typically do okay versus that. And in the 70s, gold and energy did very well against uh, in, in inflation. So we would assume if we're getting back to a world that could be similar to the 70s, possibly, that we would think gold or inflation could do relatively well. And, the, and there's gold and energy ETFs and mutual funds and all that stuff out there. James asks interest rates won't be lowered this year thoughts uh i think they'll be a little bit lower than where they are but they're unlike the beginning of the year where people thought there was going to be six cuts uh, i i thought that was ridiculous um i i i'm i'm expecting the federal reserve might cut rates once this year maybe twice but i don't even think it'll be twice um our economy i mean with the job growth today shows our economy is strong the myth that I keep hearing in the news that the economy is stinks is, is just not correct. Um, that is not correct at all. Based on the statistics that we look at as financial folks, the economy is actually doing very, very, very well. Um, and, and thus, because of that, and because of the fact that inflation still doesn't seem like it's really under control, uh, it's still a little higher than what the Federal Reserve wants. I, our, our opinion is that rates aren't going to be cut that much this year. We'll see. 
Okay, and there's a comment by Kim, as long as the money is invested in a Roth IRA is invested, if it's cash, it's not growing. I really like Financial Feminist. Um, yeah, I included some book, a book list uh, in the chat. So please look out for that. And thank you, everyone who's been uh, suggesting books. Um, Pam, uh, this is all theoretical. Let's hear about mechanic specifics, which platform fees, how how managed or unmanaged, et cetera. Thousands of dollars can sit in brokerage accounts without investors knowing where to put them. Scared they'll get dinged with fees, et cetera. Well, the beauty of the world today versus what it was 20 years ago is if you're at a Vanguard of Fidelity, a Schwab, and my platform that my firm uses is Schwab, fees are relatively non-existent. Um, in the old days, we used to buy things and there'd be 20, 30, $40. In the old days, when we had brokerage houses with Morgan Stanley, let's say, we paid a couple hundred dollars to do a trade. Well, that, you, you think twice before you buy that stock if you're going to pay $200. Well, you got down to being $10 a trade, $7, $5. Most of them gave up the, the, the whole commission thing at if it's a Fidelity Vanguard or a Schwab for the most part. So the costs have really gone down dramatically as an investor, and, and thus the fees have gone down dramatically as an investor because you can basically invest $10 and buy into something um, with almost no cost these days to you as an investor. It doesn't mean there's not a cost behind the scenes that you don't necessarily see, um, but the way they have built their organizations for the most part is they're doing it the where you don't necessarily feel the pain of the different costs of a trading side. So um, those are the mechanics from my perspective. The, it is so much better than what it used to be 20 years ago. Um, I can go buy any stock today, tomorrow. Uh, I'm not paying any commission for that. I can go find an ETF that won't cost me anything for a sales charge and, and, and could have a cost on an annual basis of one basis point. That's nothing at the end of the day. That's almost zero at the end of the day. So um, there, uh, I, I don't find fees or costs to be the huge impediment. Now, if you work through a financial advisor, they're going to charge you fees to help you do that. Um, I think you have to find the right people that you feel most comfortable with. Hence why we are big proponents of investment clubs. You get to learn with other people who are all trying to learn the same time as you are. Some are more experienced, some are less experienced, but you can leverage out the people that have been doing it for a while um, and say, well, how did you do this? And they can help you. And they're, they're more than happy to do it. Um, from the most part that I've seen from most people in most of the clubs that I've visited over the decades. I hope that helps. <laughs> 